Joining me now, First Class Father, Brian Brenberg. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Oh, thank you for having me. Boy, I don't know, you know, earning that title, First Class, and you can be the judge of that by the end of this, but I really appreciate the opportunity to do it. Well, that's what you are while you're on the show here. So, so <laughs> let's kick it off like this. How many kids do you have and how old are they? So I've got three kids, but, you know, I live in New York City. So I always say you've got to multiply that by something, you know, because raising kids in the city it feels like I've got six, even though I have three. I've got uh, two daughters, 14 and 12, Maria and Anna. And then I've got a son who's nine, Timmy. And uh, they were they've mostly all grown up in New York City. My my oldest was born in Virginia, but we moved to New York. My second was actually born in New York. And then Timmy um, was born in Minnesota. We just happened to be in Minnesota for the summer. And so he was born in Minnesota. But all three of them are New York kids, which is crazy to me because I'm a Midwestern or Minnesota kid. I never, ever thought I'd raise kids in Manhattan. Wow. Very cool. You got two girls and a boy. Are you going to try to even the score here or you're all done? <laughs> Oh man, don't even, don't even dog about that. No, the score is even the score. I can handle this score. If I have another kid, it's going to be lopsided. We're going to be playing so shorthanded. Uh, you know, we're going to be in huge trouble. <laughs> if you, if you could, Brian, please just take a second here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Yeah. So I am the host of the, of the big money show on Fox business, which starts on Monday, January 23rd at 1 PM on Fox business and excited to be doing that. This is a a very new gig for me. I've been in television for a little while. I've been a contributor at Fox for a few years, but my main thing for the past 14 years, is I've been a professor of business and economics at the King's College here in Manhattan. So I'm kind of going from academia with a little bit of TV on the side to kind of TV on a full-time basis. And on one hand, it feels like a big change for me because they're they're different fields. But on the other hand, you know, doing television in a lot of ways is like teaching. You're you're kind of in the room with some people. You've got some topics and you're trying to help people get a better understanding of how the world works and what's going on. And I've loved that process as a professor. And I, I think I'm really going to enjoy it doing it on the, uh, the Big Money Show. I've got a couple co-hosts, Jackie DeAngelis and Taylor Riggs. They are awesome. They are smart. They're going to keep me on my toes every day. And I think it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah, excited for the new show and congrats on the big money show and and getting into touching on a couple of things here uh, related to what you do and what's going on, especially with parents. One of the things I know I have four kids myself, my wife and I have four nice. kids, uh, oldest, the junior in high school. So we're starting to look at the college options and stuff right. like that. So, well, one of the questions I have for you is any kind of advice for parents looking to save money for their kids moving forward. I know it always used to be the 529 plan and that was right. the big deal. Uh, is that the same today? And what is your, I mean, a lot of kids are coming out just absolutely buried in debt. Right. They were promised it was going to get paid off. That never happened. That seems like that's out the window. Uh, what advice do you have for number one, the parents saving for the kids college, number two, the, co the college kids uh, yeah. having to deal with that debt. Great question. Yeah. So let me let me take this from an angle that maybe um, isn't simply related to saving money. 529s are a great, great way to save money. It's tax advantage. So if that's your inclination, go for it. It's awesome. But the advice I've really been giving parents and students is, you know, the money factor comes in when you're thinking about the commitment that you're going to make. You know, if you're committing to a four year degree, that's a huge commitment. And a lot of times, both parents and students decide to do that without really reflecting very much on why they want to do that or whether now is the right time to do it. My view is the education space is opening up so quickly with so many different alternatives. You know, it can be one off programs that teach you a specific skill set, online programs, community college programs. And there are a lot of businesses out there that are also opening up their criteria for hiring. So maybe in the past, it was the case that you had to have a college degree in order to get a certain job. I don't think that's the case as much anymore. And so what I really encourage both parents and students to do is start with the end in mind, actually, and really step back before you start visiting colleges and start to ask yourself, what am I aiming for? What is it that I want to end up doing? And what are all the alternative routes to get there. And it may be that
going to college is the best route to get into that field. But it might also be the case that working for a little while or doing a, a certificate program or getting some on the job training or maybe doing an associate's degree, you know, just two years or community college, there may be cheaper and better ways to get there. Don't lock yourself in to a means when what you really want to think about is the end. Start there and work backward. Yeah, very well said. And I love the advice, Brian. And it is, it's definitely nerve wracking as, as a parent, as we're getting closer and you just see now I'm a full-time railroad mechanic. That's what I do. I hustle a lot of Uber and stuff like that on the side. And one of the things I hear from these college kids, either that are in college right now, or the ones that are just a couple of years post-college are just their, their negative experience about right. how they love the college experience, the parties, the, the chicks, the, the, the fooling around the whole bit. But when it actually comes to what they got out of it, it's like you could do all that stuff and not have to drop 50 grand a year uh, yeah. to party. So it, it's very nerve wracking to see. And especially when I ask them, Hey, um, what's the latest book you read? They look at me like I'm nuts. Like what right. do you mean a book? So it's like, what are you doing here at this school? So that makes me a little, you know, gives me a little trepidation when it comes to this entire thing. And that's one of these other things, Brian, is young kids, as far as financial literacy, it seems like nothing is being done in the mm -hmm. regular school system as they're coming through the pipeline, even before they get to college, to prepare them with any kind of uh, financial sense of what to do with a dollar, right. how to make a dollar, how to create wealth and all that stuff. What can we do uh, to help our kids get a better understanding of what to do with money and how can right. the school systems better equip them too? Well, you're so right about that. I think there's been this sense, and, and it's been true for many years now, that there's something dirty about talking about money, about helping kids learn about how to invest and how to budget and, and how to save. And, and that never makes it into the classroom. And I think that's a tragedy because everybody's got to deal with it. I don't care what you do in life. I don't care where you go. That kind of stuff is going to matter for you, whether you're in the arts or whether you're in business or whether you're in academia, everything you do has a budget. Everything you do has an investment dimension to it. So I wish we'd actually help students understand it's good to care about the money because it opens up your possibilities. So here's what I would say though. I, the, the, to me, there's no, and you, you can probably uh, attest to this as well. There's nothing more powerful for a young person than the experience of having a job, earning a paycheck, and then figuring out what to do with it. So, you know, my advice to parents with, you know, you've got a kid in high school, I would be really affirming of them going and getting a job. I, I would really push, make this happen. You know, we have this world today, I think, where a lot of people try to build up impressive looking resumes by doing a lot of activities and extracurriculars and volunteering. And I'm not saying any of that is bad. Some of that can be really, really good. But sometimes people do that to the exclusion of a real honest to goodness job where they've got to show up every day and earn a paycheck. But the more students, the more young people earn a paycheck, they start to understand things like taxes. Hey, what happened to all that money? I thought I was getting paid $15 an hour. I, I, 15 bucks an hour is not showing up in my bank account. What happened to that? When you've got money, you have to start thinking about what to do with it. And when you earn money, maybe mom and dad can, can challenge you a little bit too and say, you know, there's some things we'd like you to start picking up on. We'd, we'd like you to start handling because you're becoming an adult. So I, I would really, I would number one, talk about the value of work, the goodness of work, the, the, the virtue of work. I would talk about the goodness of earning a paycheck. I would uh, make sure my students can, in, my young people can enjoy the benefits of earning a paycheck and then understand what comes with that as well. And to me, there's no more powerful lesson than the real world. And that's, that's what a job gives you. Every time you get a job, you're getting a lesson in the real world. Yeah, great stuff, Brian. And it's true. Uh, I have two of my, my older two are in high school and my sophomore just got his first job 
He got his, <coughs> excuse me, he got his third paycheck the other day. And uh, th- I, I, when he got his first one, I videotaped and it was like a big deal for him to Got open it. that up. And then he gets to see the breakdown like you're talking about, the taxes that are taken out, start to learn this stuff. And, and it makes you, you know, this is the money that you got for doing the work, right? It's right. That, that that reward for it. And, and I think that uh, so much of that is lacking, especially in the school. Like, I don't know how many times we're ever going to need to know the square root of 350, but we're all <laughs> going to need to know uh, how to use a debit card, how to, how to, how to get a credit card, what, how much percentage are they charging you an interest? And those are yeah. the things that nobody ever explains to you. You just kind of get the bills in the mail. You're like, what's all this all about? You know, so well, you often learn by mistakes, you know, which, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'm a huge believer in learning by mistakes, but you want to make smart mistakes and you want to prevent mistakes that you don't have to make. And I totally agree, man, to understand, you know, the power of compounding interest and the, the burden of a high interest rate on money that you borrowed. I mean, there's I, it's hard to think of more important things in life that you can understand. So I, I totally agree with you, but you know, all of that is a function of kind of tough love. You know, it's not just coddling. It's not, let me make things easy for you. Let me provide for you everything you need. But I think giving young people the opportunity to do some hard things and recognizing that hard, hard things are good ways to mature a young person. And they're a great way to, to love a young person, to give them the opportunity to do something that really challenges them. No doubt about it, Brian. And I want to get your take on uh, on cryptocurrency real quick, if I could, because yeah. <clears throat> as I mentioned, I, I had um, I had Stuart Vardy on the podcast two years ago when crypto was really exploded. Uh, the the Dogecoin was was going up and yeah. uh, Bitcoin was flying high. And I had asked him about it. He told me at the time he wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> and so now we've seen the decline somewhat here of crypto. We've seen the guy that, uh, you know, the, that guy with the big hair. that got Yeah, Bateman Freed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, we've seen that happen. So people are more nervous about it. But other people are saying, hey, this is the way of the future. The federal government is going to take it over. So is that the case moving forward? Are we all going to digital currency at some point in the future here? And what is your take right now mm-hmm. on crypto? Should parents get involved? Yeah, great question. So uh, I see it kind of both ways, actually. You know, Stuart says, don't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Well, I'd say don't touch it with a 10 foot pole that you can't afford to lose. You know, that that to me is the issue. Uh, some people put a lot of their money they needed on the line for crypto. That's not a great idea. It's a high risk asset right now. And you've got to treat it that way. But I got to tell you, I mean, the technology that underlies you know, blockchain technology, the, the engine that makes crypto work, there's something there. And I think there's real value <laughs> in that technology. So I like the idea, actually, of young people participating. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because it's a great learning opportunity. It, it, you know, you, you never learn something more than when you get into it, right? You, you own something, you learn about it. You own a house, you start to understand how the furnace works. You own a car, you start to understand the value of changing the oil. Uh, and it's the same thing in finance. When you own a stock, you start to care about company earnings. You start to care about inflation. So I love the idea of young people buying in uh, but at the same time, you, you've got to understand the difference between a, an, a, a financial asset and gambling and hype. And I think this has been an amazing time to see the difference between those two things. There's something real with crypto. In my view, there's something real with blockchain technology. But what happened over the past few years is the, the federal government just threw so much money around that you had a lot of people sitting around saying, what do I do with this? What do I, I'm going to buy some things. Okay. But where am I going to park it? And you had these high flying, really hyped celebrity endorsed crypto products and platforms that, that got a lot of people's attention. It looked like a get rich quick scheme. And here's the truth. Have people gotten rich quick in this world? Yes, they have, but there are far fewer get rich quick schemes <laughs> than people will tell you they there are and it's good for a young person to learn that lesson and if they learn it young it's even better so i love participating in crypto because you can learn but you got to do it the right way and i think the last year has been a great lesson on some of the wrong ways to get into it 
and, and it's interesting because it became so popular. Like my teenagers talk about it. Like, so they, they, where I don't remember ever really talking about investments and stuff like that at, right. at 15, like, but they're aware of it now. We, we have conversations about it. And we, when we talk about stock market investing and stuff like that, we always get this kind of question and they ask, is it the same as gambling? And we have these debates about it. So what, what right. I want to get your take is, is investing in the stock market, a game of chance or a game of skill? Uh, yeah, well, there's always a little bit of luck. There's always a little bit of chance involved. But I really do think it's 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 actually a I wouldn't even call it a game. It's a discipline. I think investing in the market is a discipline. And the more disciplined you are, the better that you do. There, there are things you can learn about the world by studying the companies that make the world move. And when you learn those things, you can figure out this is somebody who I think is making the world a better place and people are willing to pay them for it. That's an investment you might want to make. So I, I love that. You, look, I actually agree with you. I think today, right at this moment. Young people are talking more about the financial world than they did 20 years ago because it's more democratized. It just is. You can buy into companies you couldn't buy into as easily before. You can buy into products like crypto that didn't even exist 20 years ago. And I'm not saying there's not going to be some bumps in the road, but the fact that you're having the conversation is critical. Because at some level, it starts to get down to real things that matter, like interest rates, like understanding a company's cash flow and its profit and its loss. So all good stuff. That's not gambling to me. That's called learning and it's called discipline. And I think in the long term, it yields results. There's always a little bit of gambling in financial markets. There's always a little bit of gambling in crypto. And every once in a while, you know, the world is just so uncertain that maybe you want to take a flyer. That's OK. But you got to know it's gambling. The people who get in trouble are the ones who don't know the difference between doing the hard work and gambling. And that's the kind of lesson. It's great if you can learn it when you're young. Yeah. And I love the way you use the word discipline there with it. And what because one of the things that I think has been become a big problem when, when it relates to gambling is accessibility to it, uh, where especially now uh, sports gambling was always a thing that was a hush hush. You had to find a bookmaker. You had to get an account. You had to right. you had to go through several steps. Now you could just pull out your phone and place every kind of bet that you want to do. And it's kind of similar with the stock market now where you have these apps, the Robin Hood app. You have all these yeah. other apps where you don't have to call a broker no more. They, they remove those steps where it's like maybe you're not so quick to make the move today you could pull out your phone and buy and trade stocks in an instant like that where you could never do that before yeah. uh, do you see that as a good thing or is that a negative thing being able to have such quick access on your phone to move stocks around could be both yeah i think you're, you're right on it i love the fact that more of the financial world is open to more people in the world i think that's a good thing again because i think investing is actually a process of education and i think you you learn about how the world works by participating monetarily in it. So I do like that. But I, I do get really nervous about the accessibility of gambling and the accessibility of being able to buy and, and sell investments when we haven't done a good job of helping people um manage their emotions well you know so much of the so much of the uh, this, and this is a parenting question really you know helping your young your, your your son or daughter be somebody who can think with their head more than their heart and i'm not saying heart doesn't matter but you do your thinking with your head and if you're doing that then the accessibility to buying and selling all that means is you can do it more cheaply which is good um, but if you've got if if you're not raising your kids to think with their head and and they're it's always about how they're feeling and it's an emotion driven life. Ah, oh, that is when crypto and that's when when the stock market can get so dangerous. And I'll tell you why, because instead of those things being investments, instead of crypto being an investment or stocks being investment, they start to become an identity. And when your identity is wrapped up in being the crypto guy or your identity is wrapped up being the meme stock guy, that's where you get into trouble because you don't sell when you should because you're understanding the information presented to you. You, you hold on or you do something because you got to be that guy. OK, so for me, it, all, it comes back to identity. And, and I think as we make investment more available to people at the same time, we have to tell them. Don't let your identity become wrapped up in the money you lay on the table. 
You're not your money. You're more than that. Invest to build a life, not to build an identity. Yeah, I think you hit it out of the park there with that, Brian. I think identity and that is is a big part of our culture in general at large. Yeah. Uh, locking into one thing and holding on rather than letting go and allowing uh, has definitely become, and conformity for sure, uh, has definitely right. been a, a, a problem in, in our society. So, And, and let, let me bring it into the, the big money show here. It's a big deal, new show, big, big yeah. spot for you. What can we expect to see? What can the viewers expect when they tune in to watch the big money show here? Well, I, well, I mentioned my co-host. I've got two great co-hosts, Taylor Riggs coming over from Bloomberg. She is the finance geek. She loves markets. She loves the data. She's just I walk over to her office. She's got research reports laid out on her desk. I mean, she is deep into the markets, but she wants to translate that for a viewer that doesn't have the time to be reading that research and doing that kind of homework day in and day out. Jackie DeAngelis is my other co-host. She's an energy expert. She has been watching financial markets, used to be at CNBC, now at Fox Business. She's got deep knowledge of what's going on in the business world. And there's me in the middle. I, you know, I'm the guy who's just trying to keep up in the middle of the, of the screen. But the idea is we're having a conversation. We're talking about the issues that matter, the issues of the day, what's going on in the world. What does that tell us about what's happening in markets? What does that tell us about where money is going to be made? What does that tell us about how to make smart decisions with your business? It, it's not just for investors in the market here. It's also for people who are investors in the real economy, building a business, growing a business starting a new venture, thinking about a side hustle. What do they need to know about the world to make good decisions in their little sphere? And some of that has to do with markets, but a lot of that has to do with politics too. I mean, what happens in DC matters. If a tax plan gets passed, that's gonna affect your business. If inflation's out of control because there's a lot of stuff going on in DC, that's gonna affect the decisions you make. So we've got that viewer in mind, that person at home, and they're not just on the coast, they're not just on Wall Street, but they're but they're everywhere across America. And they want some good information, some good analysis. They want to make good decisions and they're looking for somebody to help them with that. That's exactly what we aspire to do. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to it. The big money show. I know you'll be bringing uh, the big energy as well with the three of you. So uh, I look forward to it. And let me bring it back into you as a dad here for a second. What type of disciplinarian would you say, Brian, you are as a father? And is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? Oh, that's interesting. We better ask my kids about that. They probably (laughs) have a different answer than me. I, you know, my view with kids is I want to, and this is actually consistent with my view of kind of an economy as well, but I want to provide really good guardrails. I want to provide really good boundaries for my kids. I want them to know what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. You know, for our family, we've, we've got a certain set of values. There's things that are out of bounds for us. There are things that are in bounds. I want them to know that really clearly. And I want to enforce those boundaries really, really strictly. So, you know, when my, when my back gets up, you know, when my kids see me at, at what they probably think is my worst, it's when I think they've hit a boundary and they're about to go over that boundary. I want them back inside. Uh, and that's basic stuff, like like being honest, telling the truth, treating people with respect, uh, you know, operating with your mom and dad with a positive attitude, uh, basic things like that. Uh, but within those boundaries, and this is hard for me because I think I have a, a personality that likes to get everything just right, but I want to give my kids a lot of freedom because I want them to be entrepreneurs. I want them to be creators and innovators and people who can grow up and build lives that are fulfilling to them because they're pursuing things that matter to them and they're serving others. And to me, they need a lot of creative space in order to figure that out. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect at that. I I guarantee you I'm not perfect at that. But if I can give them a sense for the right boundaries in life, I can give them a lot of space in between my hope is that that'll produce energy for them to become who they want to become. Yeah, really well said. And there is the dichotomy of what you just said there, because we just talked about having them get used to working and getting that paycheck, working to put work in to get something. And now it's to turn that around and say, uh, give yourself as an act of service, do something and expect nothing in return. So it's those two sides of the coin to try to balance out their philosophy, which is tricky to do at times for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's, you know, it's service, it's giving back. And it's also just thinking about your life and the work that you do as an act of service. You know, when you go to the marketplace and you provide a product or service for somebody, 
you, you really are serving them. What you're saying is I'm, I'm trying to understand your life and a need that you have. And I want to give you something that can help with that. And I have to listen to you and see you and hear you to give you that product or that service. And so I want my kids to think about all of life, whether they're making money or not, as an act of service, of paying attention to others and, and meeting others where they need to be met. Yeah, that's the old Zig Ziglar. Uh, if you can help enough people get everything they want, you'll have everything that you want. Hey, so, hey, amen to that. Yeah, so true. yeah, it is. And uh, all right, so looking forward to the Big Money Show here. I'm going to ask you. I, I love to ask uh, all the dads that I get on the uh, on the podcast here. Last thing I'll hit you with: What type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? Oh, good stuff. Okay, what I would say is. Uh, being a dad is a marathon, not a sprint. And you're coming into this with a vision of what you think it's going to look like. And the reality of being a dad is probably going to wear you down a little bit emotionally and physically. But what you're embarking on, to me, is one of the most sacred things that any human being could ever do, because you're, you're, you're helping to set the tone for another person's life. And I would say as many mistakes as you make, pick yourself back up, identify the things that you really, really think matter in life and, and stay at it, dad, day after day, as much as you can. Tell your kids you're, you love them. Tell your kids you're for them. Tell your kids that you, you know you make mistakes, but tell your kids that your, your goal in life is to be in relationship with them so you can help them grow up into the men and women that God made them to be. If you can do that, and run that marathon, I think in the long term, it's going to pay dividends for them. And it's going to leave you, I think, as satisfied as a dad could ever be. Yeah, Very well said. I love the message. This has been a lot of fun for me. I got to say, Brian Brenberg, your first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Father. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.